Live from WJHG in high definition, this is News Channel 7 at 10. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this special look back at 2016. I'm Leanna Scacchetti. These are the top 10 stories of the year. During spring break 2015, Panama City Beach made international headlines after a woman was gang raped right behind a local business. Video found during the investigation showed hundreds of people standing around while three men sexually assaulted a woman who appeared to be unconscious on the beach and no one stopped it. Nearly 18 months after the incident, two of the suspects went on trial in September. Delante Martisti and Ryan Calhoun both faced sexual battery charges. Both men were students at Troy University but were expelled from the school after the charges. Prosecutors said the woman was not able to consent, while the defense said the victim came on to the defendants. Jurors listened to witnesses. One of them was the victim's boyfriend at the time of the incident and took video of the attack. The victim took the stand saying she took a drink from someone that day and she doesn't remember much more until the next morning and believe she was drugged. When the time came, jurors deliberated for an hour and a half before handing the verdict. The defendant is guilty of sexual battery. Both Calhoun and Martisti were found guilty of sexual battery by multiple perpetrators. When the men took the stand, they had this to say. I will be mad at my daughter because she's acting that way, not ah. because of what they were doing. Once again, you're the moral police. I'm not a moral police, you just think that. I just think it? Yes, ma'am. You're the one testifying. Do you feel embarrassed about this at all? Um, a, a little yes and a little no because of the fact that, like, I would feel embarrassed a little bit. But then again, once two mutual people make a decision to do that, I don't. I feel like she should have enjoyed herself more. So I didn't. I didn't feel bad at the moment until it kind of aired everywhere. Both Martisti and Calhoun were sentenced to 10 years in prison, the minimum sentence for their crime. After serving their time in prison, both men will be labeled as sexual offenders and predators for the rest of their lives. Bay County has seen a lot of road projects over the last year, including the Highway 390 widening and the 23rd Street flyover projects. If you drive along Highway 390, you've probably noticed some piles of rocks where buildings once stood. The Florida Department of Transportation plans to widen Highway 390 from two lanes to six lanes from State Road 77 to 23rd Street. Some businesses have been torn down. Others, just a portion of their buildings or parking lots were, forcing many to relocate. The price tag, around $63 million, and it should be complete by 2021. According to FDOT, they're in negotiations with the second part of the project as they speak to people and businesses from State Road 77 to Jinx Avenue. That means Lynn Haven and the intersection of 390 and 77 will look different by 2018. Any business or homes affected by the changes will receive, by law, fair market value for the property. And if you lived in Bay County for any amount of time, you've probably been stuck in traffic at the intersection of Highway 98 and 23rd Street. When the 23rd Street flyover project is finished, that traffic should be a thing of the past. This year, drainage has been installed and base pillars hammered in. In February or March, the Florida Department of Transportation says they'll divert traffic to a temporary road south of U.S. Highway 98. Once traffic is diverted, it'll stay on that temporary road until the flyover project is complete, which should be in the fall or winter of 2019. Still ahead, a beloved former high school teacher was killed in a traffic crash and a fountain girl was found dead, her brother charged with the murder. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. In August, former Mosley High School teacher Ray Wishart was hit by a truck while riding his bike and died from his injuries hours later. Wishart taught at Mosley for 40 years and had retired just three months before the crash. Former students, co-workers, friends and family gathered in the gym at Mosley to remember him. There is still a light that shines on us, shine until tomorrow. Those who knew Ray Wishart say he was the kind of guy who made an impact on every single person that crossed his path. We could probably stay here in this gym all week if, and, and have every one of you come and tell a story about whatever you called him, Ray, Dad, Wish. At 63, the beloved Mosley teacher accomplished more than most could in two lifetimes. You've got a, a teacher that's got a ponytail, that's a master craftsman, 
that eventually became an expert photographer that came a deacon and a great family man all at the same time. Friday night, the Mosley Gym's bleachers were packed full of Wishart's former students, colleagues, friends, and family. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house. He had the classroom where the kids wanted to be before school, during lunch, and after school because it was their safe place. That ratty old couch in his office was a confessional, a psychiatrist's couch, a soft place to land on a rough day. We were going to do Amazing Grace, but that's just not Ray. So we're going to do a Beatles song instead. And those who knew Wishart say he'd want them to live their lives to the fullest. And knowing they'll see him again. And it's OK to cry and to be sad about it because it really is a loss. But we can't cry forever. The best way to honor Mr. Wishart is to live like him. Live with abandon, live a life of adventure. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me. In Lynn Haven, Kelly Baum Garden. Words of wisdom, let it be. News Channel 7. Wishart, or Wish, as his students called him, is survived by his wife, Diane, his two daughters, and two grandchildren. In February, 10-year-old Isabella Heffernan's body was found in a field near her home. Bay County Sheriff's deputies arrested her then 15-year-old brother, Frederick Lockridge, on an open count of murder. There's a lot of things that happen, a lot of things we see, but when we're dealing with 10-year-old child and a 10 year old victim uh, it, it's really it, it gets home bay county sheriff frank mckeithen says they believe isabella heffernan's brother frederick lockridge is responsible for her murder while the medical examiner conducts an autopsy questions remain still we are not 100 percent percent sure we know exactly why this happened or exactly the chain of events which led to it but we do know that the 15 year old brother shot and murdered his sister. The sheriff says 15-year-old Frederick Lockridge was a student at CC Washington. He's had run-ins with the police in the past. This is a hardcore kid. Uh, he lied. Uh, he was deceitful. He he screamed. He cursed. Uh, he he was like interviewing a 30-year-old murderer when we talked to him. Isabella was a fourth grader at Waller Elementary School. Your whole life you hope you don't face a tragedy like this, but things have things have gone very smooth considering the circumstances. Grief counselors have been here at Waller Elementary since early this morning to talk with students and teachers about the loss of a girl they all called Izzy. Principal Beard says they're encouraging students to focus on the good memories they have of Isabella. And I heard a young man say that she was one of those students who, if you were having a bad day, she would come sit next to you and talk to you and always had a smile. You know, just very sweet little girl. While students focus on the good, deputies are still dealing with the bad. I've said before, you can't read about it and you can't see it on TV. When you see it, smell it, touch it, and actually feel it, it's a lot different. Lockridge has since been indicted on a first-degree murder charge by a Bay County grand jury. If convicted, Lockridge faces life in prison. Heffernan was a fourth grader at Waller Elementary School. Coming up, we take a look at the first hurricane to hit Florida in more than a decade and celebrate the retirement of two local sheriffs. Before this year, the last time a hurricane hit Florida was Hurricane Wilma in 2005. A decade later, Hurricane Hermine hit the panhandle. News Channel 7's Samantha Reed was out covering the storm damage in Franklin County. Here's her report from September. Here on St. George Island, this boat is not supposed to be here. And this water, well, it's not either. And although many residents' property may look different, the message is the same. It's time to clean up. Residents were ready for it. I'm digging, you know, I'm digging out the, the culvert here. Uh, because it was all grass, so I was trying to get some of the grass out, so I knew it would drain a little bit. First responders and law enforcement were prepared for it. Between the sheriff's office, our emergency management office, and uh, our EMS, our local volunteer fire departments, we generally all train together. We do different tabletop exercises in preparation for, for something of this, this magnitude. Thursday evening, Franklin County Emergency Services, first responders and local law enforcement headed into Hurricane Hermine, shutting down roads, 
putting a curfew on Franklin County and advising everyone to stay indoors and away from the water. As far as that guff is concerned out there, it will still be a hazard, uh, not only for our county, but our surrounding counties. Fast forward 24 hours and Hurricane Hermine was gone, but not before leaving an impression. I'm surprised that I can literally swim in my yard. Several Franklin County residents woke up in the dark. To help fix that problem, utility trucks from across the country were stationed at Franklin County Airport ready to help. We had the a larger space for them to be able to stage at. Nearly 15 hours after shutting down the St. George Island Bridge, Franklin County Sheriff's officials opened it up to residents and cleanup crews, to the state park. giving them the chance to assess their own damage before extra crews were brought in. Mostly shocking was like seeing boats that were capsized and thrown up on shore and, and all that. Utility crews have already been making their way around St. George Island. For example, removing that power line from this boat. Now they say they'll be here all day and night until everything is cleaned up. In St. George Island, Samantha Reed. Hurricane Hermine was a Category 1 storm when it hit. Two men have been fighting crime in adjacent counties as sheriffs for more than a decade. This year, they both announced it's time for them to retire. Former Bay County Sheriff Frank McKeithen retired in August. McKeithen started with the Panama City Police Department in 1973. He also worked at the Sheriff's Office from 1974 until 1995. He became Gulf County Sheriff in 1995 and then Bay County Sheriff in 2003. When McKeithen retired, Governor Scott appointed Sheriff-elect Tommy Ford as sheriff. I did trust him till he just did this to me. <laughs> I trust him with my life. On his last day, dozens of employees surrounded McKeithen, honoring him for all the hard work and change he's made in Bay County. When we asked him at the beginning of the year what he planned to do when he retired, McKeithen told us, quote, I have no clue. Another longtime sheriff is also stepping down. Washington County Sheriff Bobby Haddock says he's retiring to focus on his family. Haddock has been the Washington County Sheriff since 2005. He began his career in law enforcement as an officer with the Chipley Police Department in 1978. Not long after, he became a deputy at the Washington County Sheriff's Office. In 1991, Haddock accepted an investigator position with the state attorney's office, where he remained until he was elected sheriff. Sheriff Haddock's term ends in January and Chipley's police chief Kevin Cruz will replace him. Still ahead, a case where two people were arrested for mishandling the remains at a local funeral home and a local business lands a multi-billion dollar contract that could mean hundreds of local jobs. Two people have been arrested after investigators say bodies at a local funeral home were not being properly stored. That funeral home is now closed. A sign on the front door of Brock's hometown funeral home says it's permanently closed. The move comes after the Bay County Sheriff's Office made a disturbing discovery Sunday. I'm not aware of, uh, of us having a situation like this before. I mean, the funeral home industry here in Bay County and overall is, is very professional. It appears that this particular funeral home began having some business and, and financial issues that resulted in this situation. Deputies found flies throughout the building and found six bodies being stored with no refrigeration. Ten bodies were stored in an area called the cooler, which is required to be kept at no more than 40 degrees. According to reports, the temperature in the cooler was 62 degrees. None of the bodies were embalmed, and cremations had not been done according to family members' wishes. There's a lot of grief involved, and um, our thoughts and prayers are with them. It's a very tough situation. We're trying to be as sensitive as we can to that issue. Now, we did try to reach out to the funeral home for comment. We called both of the numbers posted on their front door, but when we called, all we received was this message. <laughs> Funeral home employee Gregory Dunphy blamed a lack of supplies for the condition of the bodies. He was arrested and charged with six counts of unlawful preservation and storage of human remains. Felicia Bosch's father owns the funeral home. She is believed to be responsible for the cooler area and was charged with 10 counts of unlawful preservation and storage of human remains. We're working with the uh, State Department of Financial Services that regulates funeral homes as well as the medical examiner's office and some local funeral homes. In Callaway, Kelly Baumgarten, News Channel 7. 
Family members of six people whose bodies were improperly stored at the funeral home filed a lawsuit against two businesses and floor, four employees of the business, Brock's hometown funeral home, Florida Vantage Cremation Services, LLC, and former owner employees Johnny Brock and Don Glenn, along with former employees Gregory Dunphy and Felicia Bosch, are being sued. The lawsuit seeks damages in excess of $15,000. Eastern Shipbuilding Group made history after being awarded a $10.5 billion contract with the Coast Guard to build 25 ships. The CEO and founder of Eastern Shipbuilding Group says they're looking to fill about 1,000 jobs and they're looking for them locally. I'm still in shock. Brian Discerni, a CEO of Eastern Shipbuilding Group, says he was excited when he got a call from the Coast Guard saying congratulations. Discernia's company won a $10.5 billion contract to build 25 Coast Guard cutters. More business for the company and more jobs for the local economy. We hope they don't have to look anywhere other than Haney to get the welders they need. Eric Johnson is the senior welding instructor at Haney Technical Center in Lynn Haven. He says the school has a good relationship relationship with the shipbuilding company. They've hired a lot of our, our students through the years. We probably run 40 per or 50 percent of our students get their start at Eastern when they leave here. Eastern Shipbuilding is hiring about 1,000 jobs with a wide range of salaries. Up front, they will hire up to 40 specialists, engineers, and architects, but they're also looking for other positions. And these will be the normal craftsmen that we have now building vessels, ship fitters, welders, pipe fitters, electricians. I mean, they have to be, a, for example, a proficient welder or ship fitter, and uh, these boats are uh, built to ABS class and ABS uh, naval vessel rules, so they'll have to take a test. These new jobs in the area are expected to have a big impact on Bay County. There are studies that show for every job created by a major manufacturer, an additional four or five jobs are created in the local economy through services and other types of support activities. Senator Bill Nelson's office says the total effect of this contract could create as many as 2,000 jobs in Bay County. The EDA will now be looking for other companies to bring into Bay County that could provide support and services to complement the growth at Eastern Shipbuilding. Don't go anywhere. We'll have your top two stories of the year after the break. You don't want to miss it. Last year's spring break thrust Panama City Beach into the national spotlight. The violence, drugs, and chaos had many in our community demanding change. And because of that, spring break 2016 looked a lot different. Spring break 2016 still attracted some large crowds of students. But it wasn't the out-of-control partying we saw the year before. Other places got what we had because of what we did. Uh, places as close as uh, Orange Beach finally had to wave a, a white flag. McKeithen said the sheriff's office did some things differently this year, like increasing their patrols. We might have had five or six or seven officers down there, and they were 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60,000 people down there. We were very much outnumbered. This year, we had dedicated uh, 20 officers to Sam Patrol. Sheriff McKeithen said they were preparing for the worst and hoping for the best this year after last year's spring break sent them into panic mode. But he says this year they were way more prepared than last year, and that resulted in a lot less crime. And he's got the numbers to prove it. There were quite a few uh, kids out on the beach, but it was a different type of visitor than we ran into year before last. McKeithen said in spring break 2016, calls for service and car accidents were both down about 50% compared to last year. Drug arrests were down 72%. Sex offenses were down 60%. And the total number of arrests was down 65%. But some locals say our economy is now suffering. I can understand where they're coming from. Uh, but you know, Bay County, Panama City Beach, existed for many, many, many years. For the greater number of those years, we weren't known as the spring break capital of the world. We weren't known for the kind of problems that had developed the last few years that gave us such a national notoriety. And I'm glad that we're returning to where our roots were. After the spring break ordinances passed, March bed tax numbers dropped to 41%. But starting in May, bed tax numbers broke records each month, with July being the busiest month ever for Panama City Beach. 
And the top story of the year was President-elect Donald Trump's visit to Panama City Beach. Aaron Besant Park and Pier Park was filled past capacity in October when Trump visited. We spoke to some of the people who attended the rally. Bay County residents had nothing but love for Donald Trump at his rally Tuesday. In 28 days, we're going to win Florida, and we are going to win back the White House. Trump is a winner, a fighter. He's going to win. But elsewhere in the country, Trump is facing a lot of criticism after an audio recording was released of him making lewd comments about women on a hot microphone. Disgraceful, disgusting, inappropriate. Those are just some of the words that people across the country have used to describe those comments that Trump made about women 11 years ago. But the women who I spoke with here today say they may not support what he said, but they still support him. And they believe he's the only chance that our country has. When you heard those recordings, what was your reaction? It was 11 years ago. It's nothing different that you'd hear on a rap tape, watching a movie, nothing that you would hear just sitting in a bar from local guys sitting around you. Doesn't bother me. It was 11 years ago. A lot of people changed in 11 years. It doesn't really surprise me because I've heard it, you know, from so many other guys, you know. Um, but yes, he is running for president, and that was inappropriate, but it was 11 years ago. And ever since those comments came to light, Republicans across the country have denounced Trump. A few even called for him to drop out of the race. But his supporters in Bay County say that hasn't swayed them. We don't care about those sissy Republicans. We're not even sure they are Republicans. We actually think they're Democrats. Smart people live here in the panhandle. They realize <laughs> that there must be a change, and he's our only hope right now. You know, there may be people out there that might have been better candidates, but he is our only hope for this country right now. People were lined up from Aaron Besson all the way back to Back Beach Road. And once everyone got inside, they had to wait because Trump was running about an hour late. Well, that's going to do it for our top 10 show. Be sure to join us at 11 for the live Pier Park Beach Ball Drop. Have a safe and a happy new year.